Well, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, some of you may have seen the story written on uh, page three of the UK column. So you may be familiar with it, uh, but obviously I'll go into it in a lot more detail now, and uh, I will invite a few questions if there's anything you'd like to, uh, to tell me afterwards. Now, I'm going to tell the story. It's a complex story, as these stories tend to be, and I will be moving around a little bit chronologically, so I hope not to confuse everybody. I'll try to make it as comprehensive as I possibly can, but um, that's you'll understand once I get into it is why I've had to juggle around a little bit. Uh, there are two key elements in this story that I think most of you in this room will recognize straight away. One is the sickening and harrowing uh, treatment dished out to defenseless victims. The other is the indifference and the collaboration of the authorities afterwards. And in this particular case, we believe it takes this to the very top of the government in Scotland it goes that far and I'll demonstrate why that is the case now first of all I'll, I'll tell you the story how it began began as uh, the story is, revolves around Aberdeen and it revolves about a family called the Mackey family it's a man called Dennis Mackey his wife Anne and they had two children first a boy called Greg and the second a few years later a daughter called Holly now, Holly was born with Down syndrome and had a lot of other serious medical difficulties as well. She was not expected to live, but live she did with enormous willpower, which I can testify to right now. Now, the family were, I suppose, a normal, normal family as one would expect, although Dennis was a womanizer and uh, could be violent at times. But the marriage went on. Um, in t I'll take you up to 2000. In the year 2000, when Holly was 20, um, there was a violent disagreement between Dennis and Anne Mackey. So, uh, she's Anne Gregg now, which is a, a maiden name, which is reverted to for reasons which would be obvious. Um, now, during the course of this uh, violent argument, the husband got so violent that Anne had to take her daughter with her physically away from the house because things had got so bad. To cut a long story short, Holly became hysterical and demanded to be taken back to the house. And her mother said, why have we got to go back, Holly? Why have we got to go back? And Holly said, we've got to go back because Daddy will kill Max. Max was Holly's pet dog to whom she was devoted. <coughs> so, of course, the mother said, of course not, Holly. He's not going to kill Max. He's just angry with Mummy. He's, he's not going to do anything to Max. No, no, he'll kill, he'll kill Max if we don't go back. We've got to go back for him. So Anne couldn't understand this almost hysterical behaviour by her daughter. But then, through prompting her, it all came out. She told her, she told her mother that from the age of six, her father had started sexually abusing her. A little later on, she, a little later on, she had encouraged, the, he had encouraged the brother to join in. So, from the age of six, Holly was being abused by her father. Anne immediately, of course, went to uh, the police station, Buxburn Police Station in Aberdeen, to report this, uh, and um, put the report through, of course. Uh, Anne, of course, initially didn't believe it. She thought this was too incredible, but she asked Holly, who was a very truthful girl, and she said, no, Mummy, it's all happened. It's all happened, Mummy. But Daddy said he would kill Max, and he'd kill you if I ever told anybody about it. Now, uh, this was reported to the police, and of course Anne and Holly naturally left the, uh, the, the, the household to find somewhere else to live. That wasn't the end of the story, because this happened in May 2000. On the 24th of August 2000, the story developed even further. When, Anne, when Holly said to Mummy, I started telling about other things. She says, there were other people, you know, Mummy. It wasn't just Daddy and Greg. There was other people as well. So Anne said, are you sure about this? Are you absolutely sure? Yes, Mummy, and I'll tell you who they are. And she named another 14, 14 abusers, men and women. And amongst those abusers were the sh a sheriff, Sheriff Graham Buchanan, a police officer, Terry Major, two nurses, Two social workers, including the social worker who is responsible it was to care for Holly, and a number of other policemen as well, including an accountant and another lawyer. 
Now, at that time, of course, then Anne immediately rang the police station again to ask, A, what progress they've got, and B, that she had a lot of other names to give to them. So, the police officer invited her around to Buxburn Police Station the following day, which would be the 25th of August, 2000. And there, she was met by a police officer called Leanne Davidson and a social worker called Nicola Foote. Now, Anne and Holly together sat and get, went through all the allegations, gave all the details, all the names. And later on, uh, the Leanne Davidson said she wanted to speak to Anne on her own and that the social worker would take care of Holly for a while. Well, the social worker, no sooner had she got Holly by herself, that she injected a needle into her leg, called her a liar, and, and with the injection, there was a substance that disorientated Holly. Now, when Holly had uh, uh, finished, or when Anne had finished with uh, Leanne Davidson, the officer who was uh, doing the investigation, uh, she noticed that her daughter was in uh, great distress, and of course, being Town syndrome, she couldn't explain exactly what had happened other than she'd been injected. Anne immediately sort of said to the police, I want a doctor to see her now. You've done something to her. I want a doctor here. Of course, the police kept her, kept her there saying they were trying to find a doctor, but they couldn't find one. And she sat there for three hours until, presumably, the drug had started to, work, to wear off. In fact, Anne took the daughter to her own doctor the following day, and of course, he couldn't find anything, but he said, well, the kind of drug that was injected would be one that would be not possible to trace 24 hours later. Now, that, obviously, all that information then had been given to the police, and Anne expected that action would be taken. But time went on. For a week or two weeks, nothing happened. Eleven days after Anne had been to the police station in Aberdeen to give have all the names of these well-known and eminent people, there was a knock on her door. Ten people from the local uh, psychiatric institution grabbed Anne, pulled her trousers down, injected her, and threw her into a van, leaving Holly screaming in the flat that they had. She was taken to Cornhill Hospital in Aberdeen, where the doctor concerned, responsible for this, a man called Dr. Alistair Palin, uh, described her as schizophrenic. Fortunately, Anne is uh, a very resolute and smart woman, and she very, very cleverly played the game with the people. Although she was terrified for herself and even more terrified for her daughter, who meantime had been handed back to her father. And she managed to get out after a few days from Cornhill Hospital. What she did then was another very smart thing. She went straight to an eminent psychiatrist, one of the leading psychiatrists in Scotland, called Dr. Ellen Smith went to her at her own expense and said, Dr. Smith, I've been put into, I've never had any, medical, any mental problems in my life. I've been put into an institution where Dr. Alistair Palin has certified that I am schizophrenic. I don't know if there's anything wrong with me too. Will you do all the tests you can on me and come out with an honest appraisal of my mental state? Dr. Smith did a full appraisal, which obviously we have the documentary evidence, saying there was absolutely nothing wrong with Anne whatsoever. She'd been virtually kidnapped to try to, to make sure that she couldn't say anything, to be discredited and for Holly to be given back to her paedophile father. And of course, they were so worried about all the names that had been mentioned. Now, uh, Anne got back home and got with Holly and all the rest of it and tried very hard to get things going. But the case never took off, which I don't suppose will surprise anybody in this room, knowing the things that we know. And the, at the time, the case was effectively blocked by the Procurator Fiscal in Aberdeen. Now, the Procurator Fiscal in Scotland is like the uh, Crown Prosecution Service in England and Wales. They decide whether charges should be laid and all the rest of it, having examined the evidence. Uh, now, Mrs. Angelini was, was the Procurator Fiscal at the time, later to become Lord Advocate, which is very relevant to the story as it stands now. So, nothing at all happened. Uh, despite all the pressure that Anne was putting on and with the help of some of her lawyers as well but nothing happened and the whole case was dismissed. The police actually said that they had uh, only interviewed Dennis Mackey and two years later the son Greg Mackey which they have confirmed in writing but we shall show that that is false in a little while. Now Anne tried everything 
from that time to try and get the story out. There were other issues, including financial issues, divorce issues, which I won't go into during the course of this talk, but a lot of very, very serious issues. Um, we take the story on, Anne was getting help from some advisors who were trying their best to try and help her. And one of the things that did crop up in this time was that Anne was awarded, after a, a long battle, uh, £13,000 from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority. But there was no record of any crime having been committed. So public money was given to a woman who officially had not been the victim of crime. How could it be? To shut them up, obviously. But no crime had been committed, as far as law was concerned. So, time went on, and uh, about a year ago, I, I was invited in to try and see if I could do anything to, uh, to help the story along, to try and bring the people to justice, and to, pry, to perhaps bring the story into the public domain, which I have tried hard to do. Uh, when I started my investigations, I had the same kind of problems. Everybody wanted to block it and everything like that. But we did have a breakthrough with the media on the 19th of April, uh, 2009, when journalists from the News of the World took up the story uh, in a rather sort of uh, muted form, but it picked up on the fact about the payment from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority. I did a story on Holly, uh, which is also picked up by the local uh, paper where Anne and Holly now live in, uh, in Shropshire, uh, where they had to flee to because of the threats and abuse that, uh, that uh, they were suffering at the time. They had to escape from Aberdeen and from their home country, Scotland. Now, when uh, the, uh, uh, this became uh, apparent that uh, things were not moving in any way at all, um, we had another bit of more support because suddenly um, we got a call from the BBC. BBC Scotland in Glasgow, from one of their senior investigators, a man called Mark Daly, who some of you may remember as uh, doing something about the secret policeman, where he, uh, he covertly joined the police force in Cheshire to actually uh, find about, about racism that existed in the police force. And for this, he was granted an award, and there was a big program on it, and he became very famous. He approached Anne and Holly and myself, and said, BBC would like to do a big story on this. Could we assist them? Could we provide the documentation which Han had very, very uh, skillfully retained? And uh, so we, but it, it had to be on the basis that it was an exclusive for the BBC. It was confirmed that two programmes had been commissioned, one on BBC Television Scotland, one on BBC Radio Scotland, and that Panorama were going to do a full story that would be broadcast nationally. Mark Daly, having all the evidence, everything that he could see about this story, because it was backed up, all the contradictions, all the false things that the police and the, uh, the judicial people and even people from the National Health Service had made, all the false statements, all there, all blatant, and they were happy to go ahead with it. Mark told me that this was a story that would go around the world. Is this is one of the worst stories I've ever heard. Uh, but I know there are other cases in Scotland concerning paedophilia that we're looking into as well. And, of course, the level of corruption by the authorities made this doubly appalling. Now, uh, this went on for about six weeks. We had lots of discussions with the BBC team, and everything was set to go. On the 10th of June 2009, I received a call from a distraught Mark Daly. And he said, Mark, uh, Mark, he said, Robert, Robert, he said, I'm sorry, I've got some really bad news for you and, and Anne and Holly. And I said, well, what's that, Mark? He said, we can't do the program. I said, what do you mean you can't do the program? You said, you even got in writing that you're going to do the program. I said, well, how can it be? He says, I can't talk about it. He says, but we were threatened. We went, to, we've, been, we've been told we cannot not only do Holly's story, but we can actually do no more investigations into any stories concerning paedophilia in Scotland. If we do, we will be sacked. The three of us, that is Mark Daly, Cathy Long from BBC Radio Scotland, and Liam McDougall of Panorama. We will be sacked. I said, Mark, you, can, you can't allow this to happen. He said, well, we, tr we fought our corner. He said, we believe the story. It's absolutely 100%. But that is what we were told. 
So I said, Mark, who told you this? I said, who told you? And who, what kind of person would want to prevent a story like this coming out? So terrible, this sweet little girl and a lot of other, and seven other child victims that we knew about. Who would actually want to stop this story coming out? He says, I can't tell you, Robert. He says, I can't say, I can't talk to you anymore. He says, I can't tell you. He says, we'll all be sacked. So, obviously, I pressed with the BBC, with the Director General Mark Thompson and the head of the BBC Trust, Sir Michael Lyons. Of course, did I get anywhere with anybody? No. All I got letters saying, Mr. Green, if you wish to a, to a complaint, we have a, a, a particular forum for that, the, the complaints department of such and such a place, as if I were complaining about someone doing, using a naughty word at 7 o'clock in the evening. That is how it was treated. Uh, Mark Daly never contacted me again, apart from sending a letter apologising to Anne and making a few unfair comments, but nevertheless saying that he believed in the case and he believed everything that he had been told. Now, this obviously presented us with a, a setback because we were convinced that this, if the BBC had got hold of it, which they promised to do, we, the story would have been out last summer and the world would have known about it. But of course, this was a setback for us. Nevertheless, we persisted kept the pressure on. Uh, one of the things I, I must say in this case, working for Anne and Holly, uh, are they are the two of the bravest women I've ever come across. Nothing frightens them. They've been through hell, but they are so determined, not only for justice for Holly, but justice for the other children that have been abused, and all the ch other children in Scotland who are abu being abused now and will be abused in the future because of the inaction and the collaboration of the authorities. So it's absolutely true, nothing will frighten them. In fact, in August last year, uh, they were uh, intimidated. A shot was fired at their with the window of their home in Shropshire, a quiet little village where nothing ever happens, where crime is virtually unknown. But a shot, it bounced off the window, fortunately. Uh, but it was at head height, and either of them could have been injured or even killed. I then, the police are supposed to be reinvestigated the case after I came into it. They said they would look at it again, but they didn't do anything. They never made any attempt to, to, to uh, interview Anne and Holly. They just stayed up in Aberdeen and nobody did anything. When the shot was fired, I emailed um, Alex Salmon, who I'd already told about the, the, the case, I'd already informed him what was going on, and the fact that we felt that the Lord Advocate, a member of his government, was, involved, was deeply involved in the case. And uh, when the shot occurred, I emailed him and I also called the chief constable in Aberdeen, Grampian Police, to say that if anything happened to my clients as a result of this, I would hold them personally to blame. They had all the time that they could possibly have to look at this case, dangerous, vicious people, and they'd done nothing about it. And now, because we were putting the pressure on, there was a real threat to the life, the lives of my clients. Well. They did, in fact, uh, get a, uh, in quick time, two officers from the Grampian Police were sent down to Shropshire to interview my clients. Uh, this took place on the 8th of September. We met at the main police station in Shrewsbury, and we were taken to one of the houses that they use to interview uh, victims of rape, which are not as sort of um, deterring as a, a police station would be, a little bit slightly more relaxed, if, if that is the right word. And we went to the house, Anne was interviewed upstairs by one of the police officers, accompanied by two of the people from the, uh, the Mercia Force. And uh, Holly was interviewed downstairs by another officer, Lisa Evans, accompanied by a police officer from, uh, another police officer from the, the Shrewsbury area, and a social worker as witness. I was not allowed to sit in at the interviews, but I was allowed to sit next to a very thin partition door Holly was being interviewed in the lounge. There's a wooden sliding door there to connect it with the kitchen. I was able to sit right next to the door with my notebook. Because Holly has hearing difficulties, the conversation was uh, at a higher de decibel level than perhaps would have been normally in a conversation. So I was able to hear just about everything that was said. And I sat there for three and a half hours listening to this poor girl re relating and reliving all the horrors that had been inflicted upon her for year after year. She went through everything, talked about every name, the sheriff, Sheriff Graham Buchanan, all the others named them. Most of the rapes, in fact, took place at the home of the sheriff's sister, Evelyn Buchanan. 
Uh, it was absolutely awful. Uh, but Holly, the, the thing that I think also made a great impression on me was the, the bravery of Holly. She went through this. It was I'm sure all of you here could understand a woman being asked to relive multiple rape over and over again to, to face questioning about it. But for three and a half hours, she stood her ground. Everything she told me was everything I'd heard before, exactly consistent with what she told the BBC, exactly consistent with all the documentary evidence we'd had. And so the interview went forward, three and a half hours, and she was absolutely magnificent. But the words that haunted me and still do when the police officer, when Lisa Evans was saying, how many times did this happen to you, Holly? How many times were you raped? And she would just said the words over and over, over and over. It was, it was horrifying. But she was fantastic. And I thought maybe we might maybe make a bit of progress there. However, I'll go back a little bit in date time because I want to bring in Elish Angelini at this point, who I was making allegations that she had been involved in the original, initial case. Uh, it's very unfortunate that she was promoted from Procurator Fiscal to Lord Advocate because the Lord Advocate is in charge of all criminal prosecutions in Scotland. So she is the top person in Scotland. Now, I had a few letters between myself and, uh, and uh, the Crown <coughs> Office, and one in particular came from uh, Andrew McIntyre, who's the head of Victims and Diversity there. And what Mr McIntyre had to say was that he'd spoken to Mrs. Angelini and she couldn't remember the case at all, didn't know anything about it and wasn't even in situ at the time. Well, it is a matter of public record that Mrs. Angelini became Procurator Fiscal in Aberdeen on the 21st of July 2000, five weeks before Anne and Holly reported the names of the other members of the rape gang. So I immediately point out to Mr. McIntyre that he was incorrect in that. The Procurator Fiscal was there at the time. It, 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 the chronologically, we could prove that was the case. He started to get a little bit flustered about this, and he said, well, well, he said, it must have been some of the other people in her office who were dealing with the case, but the, the, Mrs. Angeline knows nothing about it. I said, are you serious? This is a case that's taken place in Aberdeen, not only of this magnitude, but someone we already know is a close personal associate of hers, Sheriff Graham Buchanan, and the boss was not told about this terrible case. Are you seriously telling me that? He said, well, no, he says, well, well, that's all I can think of. However, we had one other trump card to play that he didn't know about, and obviously Angelini did not know about, because in our possession, we had a letter, and the letter was written by Brian Adam MSP, who was Anne's uh, rep representative in the Scottish Parliament at the time. This letter, which we have a copy of, is dated the 27th of October 2000, four months, or was three, three months after Mrs. Angelini had taken office. The letter was written specifically to Mrs. Angelini, asking her what progress she was making on the case. Not only that, we have a, uh, Mrs. Angelini has still gone on protesting that she knew nothing of the case, but I have a letter here with her name on it from the 12th of, uh, on the, uh, the 12th of July 2001, uh, specifically about Holly's case, written from, uh, from Angelini's office to, Holly's, to Anne and Holly's solicitor. So, the Lord Advocate of Scotland has lied and lied again, and we can prove that. The rest of the case is going to be hard to get at because every obstruction is going to be placed in our way. But we've already established that the Lord Advocate, the head of all criminal prosecutions in Scotland, has lied. She's lied to the people of Scotland about her involvement in this case. There's no question about that. And if the Scottish Government were not corrupt, she would have been dismissed a long time ago, as I'd urged Mr. S Mr. Salmond and Mr. McCaskill, the Justice Minister, to do. Now, returning to the, the, uh, the, the case itself, uh, again, we got the usual delays from the, uh, the Crown Office, who was supposed to be investigating it. And in December, after sort of pressure to what's going on, we got a letter saying that they decided, the Crown Officer decided not to take any further action because there was insufficient evidence. Now, not only myself, but a team of very hard-working, highly intelligent and competent people in Scotland who can't be named at the, at the present time have also been working very hard with me and with my clients on this case. And between us, 
we have established that the police did not interview a, certain, a single named person other than Holly. And Holly named 24 people, as, as I could hear of, on the 8th of September in Shrewsbury. 16 abusers and, and 7 victims of her other than herself. 8 victims, she was one of them. 7 other child victims. So the police, Grampian police, could not be bothered to interview a single member of the, the people who'd been named. We also discovered that in the earlier investigation, in 2000, when they were first supposed to look at the case, the one that was blocked by Angelini, they actually only interviewed uh, Dennis Mackey, the father, and the son, Reg Mackey, two years later, which they had admitted to. However, once again, I have a, a document here written by uh, an officer uh, of the Grampian police called uh, Innes Walker, and this is dated the 7th of May 2003. And in it here, he refers that there are 11 people have been named. It should have been 14, other than the father and the brother. And that he's investigated it. But the police have said they only talked to two people. So, once again, absolute nonsense. Lies by the Grampian police. And we know that they have done exactly the same thing in 2009. Nothing could be, nothing should affect... Mrs. Angelini, nothing should be done to embarrass this poor woman who is Lord Advocate of Scotland. No matter what she's done, no matter how many children have been abused and raped at this present time, the Lord Advocate of Scotland does not want to be embarrassed because she's involved in it. And the Scottish Government are colluding in this disgraceful conduct. Now, uh, what we, we've been doing since, since uh, the 4th of December was to get, keep more pressure on and fortunately some of the media in Scotland like the firm and the press and journal in Aberdeen have been very good in putting uh, information out. Now on the 17th of November the firm put in a strong story attacking Angelini's involvement. Of course they got the paperwork that we provided to it for them and they, uh, they very courageously went in and they were the first real people in Scotland to really do so in a big way to attack Angelini. Immediately, a team was sent from Angelini's office at the Crown Office, more or less threatening to put the firm out of business unless they, uh, they get a retraction and an apology straight away. The firm did this, but it was under the most severe duress. I think if they'd been able to stood their ground, it could ne any court action would never have gone. It was a big bluff. But, it's all right for me to say that. The firm has 40 employees. They were on the spot at the time. And I, I can understand why they perhaps made that concession at the time. But they know as well as we do that, that Angelini and the rest of them have been up to no good. Now, uh, the other thing that we discovered a little bit later on was that Mrs. Angelini had secretly been using a private law firm to do this. A law firm, an Edinburgh law firm, a very eminent firm in Scotland, called Levy and McRae. And the person responsible for this was the senior partner in Levy and McRae, a man called Peter Watson. Now, I contacted Mr. Watson when I discovered this information, which he thought was top secret. And I said to him, Mr. Watson, could you tell me first if you are if you've actually been dealing with, um, on behalf of Mrs. Angelini? And if so... Is Mrs. Angelini paying your fees, which we have no quarrel with if that's the case, or is it being paid by the Scottish taxpayer? Is it being purloined from public funds, which is a totally different reason indeed. If the, if the Lord Advocate has been perverting the course of justice and now she is using public money to conceal the facts of the story from the Scottish public, that is a serious matter and a criminal matter. Mr. Watson got very embarrassed, sent a rather offensive email back to me saying, who, are, who the hell are you type of thing? Why should I talk to you? And I just said, well, it's up to you, Mr. Watson. You can answer the question or you can't. Anyway, he still refused to answer it. Uh, we do have a document, which I haven't got with me, and it's a kind of a privileged one at the moment, but we have a document to show that, yes, he was, and he threatened one of the, uh, uh, one of the information providers uh, with defamation if they mentioned anything more about Angelini's involvement in this case. We also know that he sent, he sent general threats to every editor in Scotland saying that they would, uh, they would be, be most severely dealt with if any of them ever mentioned Mrs. Angelini's connection in any way with the Holly Gregg case. So we have a, a, a high level attempt to intimidate the press of Scotland, the media of Scotland and the whole of the UK because Google have been threatened as well. 
Uh, now, the, I'm going to go back with one other item and one very sinister item because at the moment we have, are using everything we can, the documentation, to actually bring the people to justice. It's a hard job when you've got the police, the, uh, the, ju the judiciary, and the politicians who are in power in Scotland at the moment, all against you, who don't want to stop this case, who want to stop this case going ahead, despite the overwhelming weight of evidence. I'm absolutely sure if it was uh, Angus and Aggie who've got the chip shop in Gorbals, they'd have been banged up in jail years ago. But because it's Sheriff Buchanan, because Angelini is involved, everything has to be brought. And police officers, because not only is uh, police officer Terry Major involved, but two other police officers, Leanne Davidson, which we know, Davidson, which we know, and Innes Walker, who wrote that letter, who is now a chief inspector, have also served to pervert the course of justice in this case. So it's a very bad thing, and lots of people are going to go down when it finally, finally uh, comes to light. I, I'm determined that it will come to light in due course by one means or another. It's a terrible, terrible situation. And I think when the BBC said this is a story that will go around the world, the worst they had ever heard, I don't think they were too far wrong, although there are some really <coughs> horrific stories about that I've heard about as well, which compare with it in many, many ways, but it is horrifying. Now, there's another side to this story as well, and a very sinister star, uh, side to the story, but I will go back in time on this. I'm going to go back to 1997. Now, Anne Gregg, when she was 11 years old, her father died, and her elder brother, who was six years older, called Robert, who was known as Roy in the family, was a very good young man, a very honourable young man, and he said he would take the responsibility of looking after his younger sister and his widowed mother. And so that was the case, so he looked after them as best he could. When Anne had children, Roy was also a wonderful uncle to the two children, to, to Greg and especially to Holly because of her, of her problem with having Down syndrome. And he worked very hard, he was devoted to her, he gave lots of time to her, he used to work very hard for charities to raise funds for Down syndrome victims, and he, he was just marvellous in that way. He never married, he was a bachelor, uh, but he was a bar manager, he was very popular, he, uh, he used to like to play golf, he liked sports, he liked to read, he, liked, he enjoyed company, having a chat with all the, all the lads and all the rest of it, he was just a really straightforward chap that we all... We know plenty of people like that. He was one of those people and devoted to his family. On the 17th of November, 1997, on a lonely road just outside Aberdeen, uh, just to the north of the city, Roy Gregg's body was found in a burning car. At the time, of course, this was 1997, remember, three years before Holly had given all the information about uh, the abusers. No one really knew what had happened. Anne said the family couldn't understand. He was a, a very, he had no history of depression or mental problems or anything like that. He was a pleasant, well-liked person. He had no known financial problems, no health problems, no uh, problems with relationships. He was just a straightforward, happy guy who enjoyed his life. Why would he be found on his own in a, in a burnt-out car? The pathologist was a man called Dr. James Grieve, who I spoke to recently, uh, who conducted the autopsy, and he decided that the autopsy should, and the cause, leading to the cause of death, should be death by smoke inhalation. The other doctor who uh, performed, the, uh, pathology, or performed the autopsy was a lady doctor, Dawn Marie Chalmers, who I've now discovered is Dawn Marie Kelsey, and is practiced as a GP in Aberdeen. I have to say, since speaking to Dr. Grieve, I've also tried to speak to Dr. Kelsey, but she has disappeared. And even the people in the surgery in Old Aberdeen do not know what's happened to her. She's disappeared off the face of the earth. Once I wanted to talk to her. Very odd. But we've also discovered today that Dr. Grieve is actually the Crown Office pathologist. And when we had the call, I, we didn't know this at the time, but when I interviewed him, he got very nervous and he said, near the end of it, he says, it sounds as if you're trying to implicate me with all this. And I said, with all what? He said, well, whatever you're talking about. And I said, well, we're not trying to implicate anybody. I said, we just want the truth. I said, if you acted honestly, then there's no problem. But I will tell you, Dr. Grieve, and you're an expert, but let me tell you this, because I've been doing a little research myself, although I know nothing about these things, but I have talked about people who do know what they're talking about. And one of the first things that they have said 
is that it's very, very, uh, what we should say is it was described as an unexplained death, but probably suicide. That was how everybody was led to believe it was going to be a suicide. I said, first of all, I said, I do understand that it's very rare for anyone to commit suicide by setting fire to themselves. It's too painful. Sometimes it happens in political demonstrations or people who've got a previous history of being very disturbed. But that didn't apply to Rory. We must accept it's very rare for people to kill themselves in that way. It is just so awful and painful and unpleasant, as I'm sure we can all imagine. And I said, to, so why, um, why would it be that you didn't uh, advise an inquest on this? So Dr. Reeve again got very nervous and said, oh, well, I just go on the facts. I didn't know, I didn't know about there's a motive for murder or anything like that. I said, well, even without the motive for murder, someone being found in a burning car is almost certainly indicative of arson, which is usually used to actually, not only to uh, cover up other crimes, but to destroy evidence as well. But he couldn't, and he said, oh, well, I just made my decision on what I saw, and since then he did have no contact with me whatsoever. Now, for many, we talk about the autopsy. We've only recently served the autopsy. For nine years, Anne had been actually trying to get hold of the autopsy about her brother's death. And each time the Crown Office either ignored her requests. Now I think we can see why. We eventually got it. I applied for it. And they told me that um, they, they did have the autopsy. But it would be better if a doctor that they appointed would call us about it rather than send it to us and explain what the autopsy was all about. Because we might not understand it. We might misunderstand what's in this autopsy. So one of our doctors will ring you and he'll, tell, he'll explain it fully to you exactly all the implications and what everything means because you will probably won't understand it. So at this point I said, well, look, send us the autopsy. We'd rather have it. If we don't understand it, we've got doctors we know who will explain it to us. So don't worry, just send us. And, and if we're not sure about anything, we'll find a doctor to explain it to us. Eventually they did send the autopsy. This was three weeks after they'd said they weren't going to, to conduct the investigation. It arrived on uh, New Year's Eve 2009. In the autopsy, it was it made clear that a good deal of alcohol was found in the stomach of Robert Gregg. It's like Robert Gregg being the bar manager, he was a very moderate drinker. He didn't drink a lot of uh, he didn't drink a lot of alcohol at all. The alcohol that was found in his stomach was a, a brown liquid which was thought to be whiskey. Robert Gregg, unlike most Scotsmen, hated whiskey. He never drank whiskey. As well as that, there was severe, severe damage to Robert's skull. Two ribs were broken and his sternum was broken. All the experts, and they are acting informally at the moment, I would like a proper formal uh, sort of uh, analysis of this, but all the, and we've talked to a lot of people, believe that the most likely thing was that he was bad, severely beaten, caused the injuries that, it, that occurred, uh, had alcohol poured down his throat and was then thrown into the burning car to die. We also believe that one of his rescuers, or so-called rescuers, was one of the murderers because we discovered, or Anne discovered, that the person who had allegedly rescued him and got a medal from the Royal Humane Society was known to Dennis Mackey. Now, where this all fits together is, if I take you to 2001. Now, I should explain, if you're not aware of this, if people who have Down syndrome um, don't necessarily link things together. But people like Holly, she is a competent witness. She's been described as a competent witness, not only by the police themselves, but also by medical experts who've examined her at the time to make sure that whatever she said could be taken seriously. So... That being the case, uh, Holly had, uh, was, there's no question about anything that she said. In fact, one of the experts actually said that Holly does not know how to lie. In her concern, she does not know how to lie. Also, people who suffer from Down syndrome have very vivid memories and long memories. And they remember things in great detail, far more so than people who don't suffer from that c c kind of affliction. Uh, so, and they also don't have the ability to fabricate or close things from their mind. So you can see already what a terrible effect that must have had on poor Holly, who couldn't even blank out these terrible rapes and ordeals that she'd suffered for 14 years. But obviously, could there be a better witness? 
hard. I don't think it's difficult to find. I, I think it'd be very difficult to find a more reliable witness than Holly Gregg. So uh, this went on, and uh, we worked very hard to try and uh, sort out what is going on here. It's a very, very bad story. The Crown Office, um, to, but just going back to the, the death of Roy Gregg, in 2001, Holly came forward with some more information to her mother that was previously unknown, that will explain everything that I've just told you. One day, she said, Mummy, she says, I have to tell you, she says, you know, she says, um, Uncle Roy, he found me, he found Daddy having sex with me. Anne said, what? Holly said, yes, Mummy, yes, Mummy. He, he came in one day, he came to the house one day, and he came in and he saw, he found Daddy having sex with me. And Anne said, what happened then, what happened? Uncle Roy said to Daddy, don't you ever touch Holly again, don't you ever touch her. And Anne said, can you remember when this was? When did this happen? And through a process of elimination, they had found that it, it took, must have taken place between two and three weeks prior to, to uh, Roy's death. So Roy Gregg was murdered, we believe, on the instructions of Dennis Mack. He was supposed to have an alibi at the time. As far as we know, he was working on an oil rig. And the, the rescuer, by the way, was another oil rig worker who he knew. Or any, or, and or other members of the rape gang. Every single member of the rape gang is a potential murder suspect. So that is the story of, of, of Roy Gregg and what has happened there. So we are obviously pressing very hard on that side of the story as well. So we have multiple rapes and we have almost certainly a murder here. I asked Anne about, um, about her brother before he died. And I said to her, was there anything strange about Roy just before he died? And she said, well, not really. We were all trying to think that. It seems he died so in such strange circumstances, but we couldn't understand anything at all. And I've gone over in my mind, was there something strange about his behavior prior to his death? And now I know what I know. So that, that makes, amplifies the fact. She said, all I can say is, knowing my brother as I did, he said he was a person, if there's a problem, he would, he'd usually like to think about it, first of all. He wouldn't just come out with it. He'd think about it. He says, and I did think at the time there was something on his mind that he, he wanted to tell me about. He said, but obviously I could have had no knowledge it was something of this magnitude. He said, I said, it must have been just some personal problem. But there was something there that I knew he would talk to me about so, at some point, but he was, he was just thinking about it. I think another important thing just to mention is that it was Holly's 18th birthday, six days after Roy died, and he had planned the party for her. This was all planned. He brought a beautiful bracelet. So there was absolutely no reason why he would kill himself. And why would he, as he was so protective towards his sister and his niece? The last thing that he would ever want to do would be to leave them to the mercy of Dennis Mackey and the gang. But he had to be silenced to shut him up so that he couldn't testify, not only against Mackey, but Sheriff Buchanan and police officer Terry Major and the nurses and the social workers and the solicitor and all the rest of the despicable gang. He had to be shut up. So this is the, the, the case that we're, we're having to deal with at the moment. It is a really, really appalling case, I think you'll agree, having heard all this. We've got a long way to go yet. Um, we are getting some support from some of the politicians in Scotland now at various levels who really believe that this case, that the lid cannot be kept on this case for much longer because we have so much documentary evidence. What we are looking for is someone in the media who's bold enough to do something about this. What I was sick and tired of hearing the major people in the media say, oh, we can't print, there's no proof, we'll get sued, and all this kind of thing. I said, no, you won't. I said, oh, we've got the evidence here. There's no way this can come to court. And we could call us all as witnesses, Holly and myself, the rape gang, the rest of the victims. Do you really think that anybody is going to take you to court over on this? But no, they, we, well, I don't think it's to do with litigation. I think it's other people putting pressure on them, but there we are. But I was very concerned that nothing was happening. What I did in October, just going back to the 3rd of October, I decided that uh, I would go and make a, a public speech at the Quaker Hall in, uh, in Edinburgh. And I in doing so, I would name all the members of the gang publicly and all the known victims. Because I wanted them, if, if somebody was going to go for me, I wanted them to go for me then. So I did that. And I also sent it the, all the details to everyone, including 
Buchanan's fellow sheriffs in Aberdeen. I sent them all the details to them at, at the court there. And so everyone knows about it. All the MSPs know about it. Uh, all the councillors in Aberdeen know about it. Everybody knows the background of this case. And I'm sure that very few of them can actually really dispute the facts about it. Has anybody got the guts to do it? The, me the media know all about it. Has anybody got the guts to take this story further? I do hope so. In two weeks' time, I'm going to Aberdeen myself, uh, and I'm going to do my own little protest. I'm going to take a banner there. And I'm going to take leaflets, again, with all the names of the people involved. We actually have blitzed Aberdeen with leaflets, by the way, uh, to, uh, to, to let the people in the areas where the paedophiles operate know about what's going on. And I'll be doing that again in Aberdeen in two weeks' time. And I will also be going, I'll be standing outside Marks and Spencers, which I've never been to Aberdeen in my life, but I believe that's the place to stand on Union Street. And it's also quite conveniently very close to the Sheriff's Court. So I'm going on a weekday, it'll be a Friday when I'm there, and I'm going to spend a bit of time at Marks and Spencers, and then I'm going to go down to the Sheriff's Court with all the leaflets naming Sheriff Buchanan, and I'm going to hand them out there. As one way or another, I'm absolutely determined that justice must be served in this terrible, terrible case. It really is appalling. Um, one other thing I will say, I'm almost at the end of my speech now, but Holly, in the nature of things, has been coming up with more information about other abusers, even after the 8th of September. And one, there, are, there are three other people, particularly, that uh, we're very concerned about. One in particular is the head of Beechwood Special School in Aberdeen, where Holly was a pupil. His, man, his name is Andrew Young. Uh, Holly has confirmed that he abused her. He also abused her at the house of the police officer, Terry Major. And I understand that he's taking other children at this present time to be abused by paedophile rings in Aberdeen. While they're at school, the parents are taken to school, he takes them or has people taken on the bus to, the, to his friends in his circle. So Young has been named as well. Have the police done anything about that? Have the social services done anything about it? No, they've done nothing. So this man is at large at the moment, quite apart from the rest of the paedophile gang, who can carry on their evil ways, knowing they have the full protection of the Lord Advocate of Scotland. This is effectively a spa state-sponsored rape gang, supposed to be a civilised society. Yes, you know, sometimes they ridicule country, people in other countries about the way they're governed, their legal system, but this is happening here in the UK, part of the United Kingdom, in Scotland right now and nobody is doing anything about it. Nobody who has the power is doing anything about it at all. It's a terrible, terrible case. Um, all I can say is I'm going to do everything I possibly can to, to, uh, to make sure that people are brought to justice as quickly as possibly can, as possibly can, because we're not talking about past crimes here, we're talking about crimes that are going on at the moment. The Lord Advocate should be dismissed without any delay. She should be arrested and charged for repeatedly perverting the course of justice. Mr. Salmon knows it, as I said. Mr. McCaskill knows it. The curious thing we found out about Mr. McCaskill the other day, um, he used to work for Levy and McRae, the law firm we were representing Mrs. Angelini. By a strange coincidence. But what a can of worms. Absolutely <coughs> terrible. It really is that bad. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions? I've, there's a lot of other things, but I, I couldn't include everyone. Thank you.